Today we're going to be talking, continuing talking about being prepared for faith or by faith through, from the book of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. We've been studying this, this, uh, these two books of the Bible now for, uh, well, since January. And um, Paul was so concerned about the Thessalonians' faith. Um, faith is your belief in God, but it's, it's more than just a mental thing. It's, faith has to do with action. It's, it's, it's doing. It's it's not just saying, I believe in God, but it's actually living your life to where, I, I, I like to put it this way, if I were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict me? So more than just words, it's your actions, it, that's the evidence of faith. And Paul was really concerned about the Thessalonians because there were, the, they, they were this, uh, this town, this Greek city, and there was a lot of, of uh, idolatry. Uh, they had um, they had pagan temples uh, in 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 uh, the town of Thessalonica and and in this town, the Christian church is this new church. Paul Paul visited there on a missionary journey and he preached the gospel and they received it and then and then he installed an eldership team, a group of people, uh, a pastor, and and he's very concerned about them because they were coming under a lot of fire. They were coming under a lot of heat. And um, it wasn't easy being a Christian in, in those days in, in a Greek town where everybody served all kinds of other gods. And so it was very difficult. And so because he was so concerned about them, he decided to take Timothy. They were on his, his second missionary journey. And he said to Timothy, I want you to go to the town of Thessalonica and, and I want you to just check on the church there. Um, and, and, and I want you to strengthen and encourage them in their faith. I want, in other words, I want you to tell them, keep on keeping on, okay? Uh, you're you're going to face trials. You're going to have temptations. You're going to be persecuted. But remain strong. And so today we're going to look at that passage of Scripture that Janet Prince read this morning, uh, which is about our trials and our temptations. And, you know, I, and if you read the letter that I sent out, you know I love trials on TV. You know, I love A Few Good Men. The, the court scene in A Few Good Men, men is one of the top ten scenes of any movie of all time right so i just i just love i just love a few good men and jack nicholson and you can't handle the truth and all that but i don't like going through trials myself i don't mind watching them on tv and to be honest with you if you're going through a trial i'm not too bothered by that as well no i'm kidding i'm joking with you i love you i don't want you but you know what let's be honest we need to go through trials the only way we're going to be strong so but our faith can be hindered by the trials of life by the trials you go through so here's what here's what paul says to the church at, at, at what he writes to the church at at thessalonica thessalonica he says this we sent timothy to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. That word unsettled, we're going to look at that in just a few minutes and what it means. Okay, It's very important that we understand what the word unsettled means. Uh, you know quite well you were destined for them. Don't you hate that? I mean, I don't, like, I don't like reading that. You're destined to face trials. Peter said it this way in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. He said, he said dear friends... Do not be surprised at the painful trial you're suffering as though something strange were happening to you. It's just a part of life. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter what race you are. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter what faith you are, what denomination you are. It doesn't matter if you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth. That silver spoon is going to tarnish. That's trials. It just happens. It doesn't matter how controlling you are and how well you set up your situation and your space so that nothing could possibly go wrong and then it will. Because it does. And I'm not speaking negative here, I'm just speaking factual. No matter how hard you try, no matter how good you are, no matter how righteous you are, no matter how many sins that you turn from and so that you're living a perfect life, you will face trials. It's just we're destined for them. In fact... When we were with you, we kept telling you that we will be persecuted. And it turned out that way. Now, the reason that Paul used the word persecuted and trial in the same sentence is when you go into the original language, the Greek language which Paul wrote this letter in, the word trial and the word persecution are very similar. It's almost the, the identical thing. 
The origin is the only thing that's different. Now look, bad things come to us because of three reasons. I'm not going to say they come to you for three reasons. I'm going to say that they, they come to me for three reasons because this is what I know for sure about me. Sometimes bad things happen to me because I do dumb things. I do stupid things and bad things happen because of it. And so, I mean, I'd love to say the devil's doing it to me or I'd love to say that it's that person's fault. But in reality, I just do some dumb things sometimes and bad things happen because of it. Sometimes bad things happen to me just because that's the way life is. Just because sometimes things break. We live in a fallen world. We live in a world that, that, is, that is breaking down, right? Plus, our bodies are eventually, they are breaking down, okay? So it's just, this is life. Sometimes bad things happen to me because somebody else does something to me. So it's either myself caused it, just it just happened, or somebody brought it to me. But what difference does it make? The, what we need to do is learn how to get through them. What we need to do is learn how, when we've done something stupid, when, we, when we've brought a trial on ourselves, confess, ask for, ask for forgiveness. Try and get it right, and then move forward. If it just happens, then you just move with it, and you, and you, and you fix what needs to be fixed, and you take care of what needs to be taken care of, and you move on. And if somebody like persecutes you, if somebody is bringing some bad things to you, this is the hard one. Because... Uh, we may want to get even, but what we need to do is get through it. Getting through it is more important than getting even. So it just turns out that we're going to face them. Now look, every one of us in this room, and I love that Paul said we sent Timothy to strengthen and encourage you. Every one of us in this room could use more strength and more courage. I can. I need to be encouraged. I, I, I love it when people come alongside me and say, hey, man, hang in there. I'm praying with you. I'm standing with you. I had a conversation the other day with a good buddy of mine down, uh, many of you know him, Robert Flores. Uh, you know, pastor's in Pasadena. He spoke here at our marriage retreat before. He's spoken before. Robert and I are great friends, and we call each other now and again. And then Ron Swore, another guy who spoke here at the church. My pastor, Paul Risser. Sometimes I call these guys, or they'll call me, and we just, we just encourage one another. Man, hang in there. Hang in there. You know, I love to call Eric Ratliff, who's now pastoring up in... in uh, uh, Brookings, Oregon, you know, and then it, Eric served on staff here for years as Kevin's brother, and I call, call Eric up sometimes just to encourage him because, because we all need to be encouraged. And we all need to be stronger because every one of us is going to have trials, no matter how good you are. And, and let me tell you something about trials. They can shake the faith of even the strongest of Christians. They can shake your faith. They can cause you to doubt God's love. They can cause you to doubt your worth. And man, let me tell you, if the devil can get you to doubt God's love and to doubt your worth, ooh, the havoc he can wreak in your life. So we've got to be on guard against that all the time. And faith, see, faith helps us to stay strong. And here's the other reason why we need strength and encouragement. Tires, trials are very tiring. If you've been through trials, I, I, I'll never forget, you know, and not, this isn't, I'm not saying this to boo-hoo, you know, poor me, poor me, but... but <clears throat> Back in 2003, okay, and we bought this building in 2003, paid $2.5 million for it, put $525,000 down, took a loan out for twenty or $2 million, and, um, and we've been paying it off ever since, and we've not missed a payment, praise God, right? Isn't that good? We've not missed a payment, and uh, our insurances are up, our property taxes are all paid. Isn't that great? So anyway, that's because of, of God's faithfulness and your faithfulness, but anyway, we bought this building in 2003, and, and you'd think that'd be a great time of celebration, finally. I mean, since, 2000, or since 1990, Joni and I came here and started this church. We've been vagabonds. You know, you've, some of you have been with us. We've been, we've been to Ace Hardware. We were at the Pilates next to Togo's. We were out at Gavilan College. We've, we've had church just about wherever they let us, and for as long as they let us. And then they would kick us out, and we'd find someplace else. Or God, would, God would find us someplace else. But... Um, you know, the early years of our pastoring at church here were much like my college life. I would go to college as long as I could go there, and then they would kick me out. Um, so I just thought it kind of mirrored college. But anyway, it was always their fault, though. I want you to know that. The professors had it in for me. They didn't like me. Okay, move on. But this would be a great time in our life, right? But from, and for no reason, listen, 
I, I, any of you that were here at that time, and some of you were, I was searching, racking my brain. From 2003 to 2004, we had about 125 people leave our church and about $12,000 a month go out the door. And I didn't know why. I mean, I couldn't figure it out. We were trying to figure out, God, what's wrong with us? What did we do wrong? Are we bad? Are, we, are, you, are, you, are you cursing us? Are we unworthy? Should we leave? I mean, what's going on? We couldn't figure it out. It was, it was one of the most difficult times in our life, in Joni and I's lives. And then you, you add to that, our son just went to the army, and it was just stressful. I mean, I had, um, I'm not a sad person. I'm just not a sad person. Now, that doesn't mean I'm always happy, okay, because I, 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 I can get my anger on. So, but I don't tend to be sad, I'm not that way. I'm, I'm, I'm usually happy and fine, or I'm, up, I'm ticked off about something. That's pretty much me. Okay? So it's, it's it, yeah. Anyway, but I was, I'm telling you, it got to like in January, February, I was, I was sad. It was the saddest period of my life that I can remember. And, and I was really very close. I was, had a, a counselor friend, Chuck Shoemake, um, who was helping me through this, and we were, I was on the verge of a, of a, a, a nervous breakdown, and um, he sent a, we, we, we went on a kind of a forced sabbatical for, for about two weeks. Saved our life. Saved our life. Um, but they're tiring. You go through a trial, and your, your mind's constantly going. You're churning. What's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? How do I fix that? How do I strengthen? What do I do? Okay? It, it's, they're difficult. And well, here's, what a, here's what a trial is. Anything that crowds your life, anything that constricts you, um, and, and the intent. Now, there's things that crowd us, and there's things that constrict us. But the thing with a trial is there's something more to it. It crowds and it constricts with the intent of causing anguish or distress. That's a trial. So you go through stuff sometimes. You get crowded at work a little bit or constricted a little bit. That's maybe not a trial. That may just be a boss saying no. But if it's, if it's meant to, to cause you anguish and distress to the point of wanting to quit on God, that's a trial. And that's why trials are so dangerous. is because they can easily get you to say, what's the point? Anybody been there? I have. I have. What's the point in all this? But this is what God said to Jeremiah when he was going through a trial. And Jer Jeremiah was complaining to the Lord, and here's what God said. And, and what this tells us is how God thinks of you. God said to Jeremiah, if you've raced with men on foot and they've worn you out, how are you going to compete with horses? And that's basically what the Lord said to me back in April and May of uh, April is when we went in, in 2004 when we, we, when we went on vacation and, and just Joni and I slept for about 10 days. Is basically God was saying to me, if you've been worn out by men on foot, how are you going to race with the horses? Because that's how God sees you. And so God, God doesn't want to lighten your load. He wants to strengthen your back. Our tendency is, Lord, take this from me. And God's saying, grow through it. See, the thing is, when you, when you grow through trials, it makes your faith stronger. And when your faith gets stronger, it's easier to go through trials. And so they kind of play off of one another. The stronger my faith is, the easier it is to go through trials. And the more trials I go through, the stronger it, uh, my faith becomes. There's things that Joni and I have gone through that when we go through things now, we look at each other and say, yeah, but remember when we went through that, this is nothing. This is nothing. I was talking with a friend the other day. He called about uh, their son. Their, their son, um, they want to kill him. And um, <laughs> my job was to root them on. Um, <laughs> I always say, you know that when, when Abraham sacrificed Isaac, that Isaac was, was 12 years or younger, because if he was a teenager, it wouldn't have been a sacrifice. <laughs> all right, so anyway, all right. All right, enough with the killing. You know I'm kidding. We love our kids, but come on. They were having, they're just having a hard time with their kid, and, and 
what we went through with our oldest son who was here last week and back in Las Vegas and, and you know, he knows that we'll share about this quite freely. But we had, we had I mean, there was about a five-year period of time where I, I would never wish that on anybody. But I'll tell you this, when I talk to parents that are going through troubles with their kids, inside part of me is going, this is nothing, folks. <laughs> this is nothing. And it gives us, because we got through it, we're able to say to them, you'll get through this. You wait, about 26 or 27, they're going to turn around and tell you what great parents you were and how, how they can't believe you loved them and, and, and walked through them with them and, and it, how much they disappointed you and how sorry they are. And right now you may feel like the worst parent in the world and the devil wants you to believe that and it's not true. It's just not true. See, the danger of trials that they, they unsettle us and that's what Paul was warning the Thessalonians. Don't be unsettled by these trials. Which, and, and the word unsettled means to be disturbed or upset or made anxious. So in other words, Paul could be saying, listen, you're going through trials, but don't be disturbed by them. You're destined to go through them. It's just part of life. Or don't be upset by them. It's not going to do any good. I mean, you can, you can curse and scream and throw a tantrum. It won't help. I've tried it. I, I was told that, and I thought, no, I don't believe them. I'm gonna, next time I have a trial, I'm going to throw a, a major fit. And, and, and I'm just going to see. And it, it just didn't help. In fact, I got a headache from it. I gave myself a headache. So I had a trial brought on, and then I made it worse by being dumb. Don't be upset. That's what Paul's saying. And then don't get all worried and anxious and, 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 and nervous about it. You're going to get through it. it. Romans 8, 31. If God's for you, who can be against you? God knows. God knows. Everything that happens in my life, this is, the, this is the faith that I have. And this comes from, this comes from the book of Job. It also comes, this, this thought that I've had, it comes from the book of Job. It also comes from, from Psalms chapter 31, verse 15, where David says, I say you are my Lord. I say you are my God. My times are in your hands. That's what David said to God. My times are in your hands. And times would be all, that, all that's you is in God's hands, right? Well, I believe that. So because of that, whatever happens in my life is father filtered. And just what I said last week about Jesus now being, you know, he's the rock split and all that, and Jesus being our big brother, our advocate, that, that Jesus now is our big brother who says to adversity, if you want my family, you've got to come through me. But there's things that God allows for you to go through because he wants you to be stronger. He wants you to be, he wants you to be powerful. Don't you want your kids to be strong? Don't you want your kids to be tough? Not mean, but tough. We want our kids to be tough. We want our kids to be strong. they got to go through hard times. It's the only way it happens. The, the word unsettled also means to move or change position. In other words, we're coming to buy a building. God loves us. God is blessing us. We're buying a building. We're going to have a home for once and for all. A permanent location. We're still here. 13 years later, this is still our building, Right? And it's just a time of great joy and a great and great uh, happiness to finally have a home. And, and, and so you're thinking, God really loves me. and God really cares about our church. And then you're going through trials of people leaving your church and you're thinking, God must hate me. God must be upset. We must be cursed. And so what it can do is the trial can make you change your position. That you had a belief, that you had a thought, that you had this, this this understanding of who God was in your life, and then because you go through a trial, that changes. It's almost like you think God's in heaven with a big daisy going, I love them, I love them not. I love them, I love them not. But wait a minute, he's immutable. We know about him omnipresent, God's everywhere. We know about him being omniscient, God knows everything. We know about him being uh, uh, omnipotent, being all-powerful, but he's immutable too. And immutable means that God doesn't change. He doesn't change like shifting shadows. And when God makes a decision, he makes a decision. It's done. It's final. And God has made a decision to love us unconditionally. Done. Final. Never changing. The other way we can understand the word unsettled is to wag back and forth like a dog's tail. That's the word picture from the Greek, to wag back and forth like a, like a dog's tail that he loves me, he loves me not. He loves me. So when good things happen, God loves you. When bad things happen, God doesn't. Paul's warning us to remain steady during these times. These persecutions, 
We're just, we're destined to face them. There's a reason we face them. So let's go through them. The second thing that Paul talked about, not just the trials that we face, but or the trials that we have in life, but the temptations we face. Both these things can, can, can get us off our game, so to speak. Trials and temptations can move us from where we, where we are to some other place. That's not, that's not good. Now, trials can, can, can bring us closer to God. I love what a, a Chinese... Um, a, a Chinese uh, underground Christian in, in China has a, quite an underground Christian uh, sta- a network. And uh, this Chinese brother who is in the underground uh, in China said, the thing, about, the thing about us Christians in China, we're like nails. The harder they hit us, the deeper they drive us. I want to I wanna be deep in the Lord. I don't want to be shallow. You know, we read the Psalms and we're like, oh, the words of David, they're so deep and they're so, they're so, they minister to me so much. And, and, and we'd love to be David, but I don't know if we'd want to go through what David went through. I'm reading about David right now in 1 Samuel. The story of David starts in 1 Samuel 16 and goes through 2 Samuel. The man faced a lot of trials. The man had a lot of battles, real ones. Life and death battles, not the kind of battles that I face. These puny, weak, miserable, little bitty annoyances. His were real life and death battles with giants and armies where there was blood flow. I mean, this guy had trials and he also had temptations. And that's part of part of his trials and temptations are what makes David so deep. They're also what made Paul so strong in the in the New Testament. For this reason, I sent to find out about your faith. Paul is concerned about their faith, <clears throat> which we all need faith. He says, I was afraid that in some way the tempter might have tempted you and our efforts might have been useless. In other words, you might have left the faith. And so Paul was concerned about them. But he, he later, we're going to see, he later was, commends them that they, they, they hung in there through their persecutions, trials, the temptations. They hung in there with God. And I want to I tell you, hang in there with God. It's worth it. He's worth it. He's worth it. And not just is God worth it, your life is worth it. And it's the best life you can have is serving Jesus. The tempter tempts, it's what he does. Sounds like a Geico commercial. The tempter tempts, and he's going to tempt. And he's not going to stop tempting you. You're going to be tempted for the rest of your life. You know why? Because you still have desires. Because you still have taste buds. Because you still, you still have senses. As long as we have five senses, we're going to be tempted. It's just the way it is. We see things. We want things. We smell things. We taste things. We touch things. We're touched by things. We think things. We imagine things. We fantasize about things. We're going to be tempted until we die. That's just the way it is. And and so, and there's nothing fair about it. It's just the way life is set up. And you say, well, why did God make temptation real? Because in order to make temptation, well, as soon as God made free will, temptation was a part of it. God didn't have to give you free will. When God created, he created animals. They don't have free will. Now, there's some things they can choose, you know, if they're going to run this way or run that way or, you know, but basically animals don't have a, a free will like you have. Like we have, we can make decisions. Um, And so once God made free will, then that meant temptation was now on the table. And so because of your free will, we have temptations. There's things that can tempt us. And the tempter loves to come at us when we're weak or weary. And that's why why the temptations are, are linked with trials. Because remember, trials are tiring. And sometimes when you're going through a trial in your marriage or a trial with your children or a trial on your job or a trial with your, with your friend or a trial with your, with your in-laws or trial with your business, your finances, whatever it is, if you're going through some trials, they can start to wear you out. As you get worn out, the, you're, you're more susceptible to temptation. I'm telling you, it, rarely are you going to be tempted on a, you know, that heavily in church on a Sunday morning, Right? 
It's pretty easy to be a good Christian on Sunday mornings at church. But hey, Monday's coming. Monday's coming. And rainy days and Mondays always get me, right? They always get us down, right? They, they just happen. And they, they come. And that's the, the devil knows when to attack. And he knows how to attack. And, and here's the other thing. He knows why he's attacking. Because he wants to destroy you. Jesus said this in John 10.10. 10, the thief, the devil, the tempter, however, whatever you want to call him, Beelzebub, Lucifer, Satan. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that you would have life and life more abundantly. So there's the difference. And, and so Satan knows why he's going to tempt you. Is He is going to destroy you. That's what he sets out to do. But we resist the devil, James says, James chapter 4. If you resist the devil, he'll flee from you. All he can do is tempt. He can't force us to do anything. God could force us to do something, but he won't. The devil can't force you to do anything. He doesn't have that ability. But here, the devil also knows our soft spots. He comes at us when we're weak or weary, and he knows our soft spots. He knows, he knows what, is, what is alluring for you. If you're going to go fishing, take me with you. No, if you're going to go fishing, you have to know, one, what fish you want to catch, and two, what bait they like. Because if you're using the wrong bait, you're not going to catch anything. You're just having an afternoon. But if you want to catch fish, then you better know what fish you want and you better know what bait they like or what lures will work. And so the devil knows what bait you like. But listen. Among the churches, this is what Paul was commending them, among God's churches, they, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you're enduring. You are enduring. Church, you are enduring. I am going to endure. I normally don't do this because it, sometimes it annoys me when pastors you do this all the time. Turn to the person next to you and say, you know what I mean? Have you ever been in a church where they do that all the time? But can we just say that? I am enduring. Can we say that together? I am enduring. I'm going to endure. We are all going to get through this. I'm telling you. We keep our faith strong. We stay in the word. We're going to get through this. But knowing your personal triggers are important in order to be strong when tempted. What are your personal triggers? Your bait. What's your bait? What lures you? For some people, it's alcohol. For some people, it's drugs. For some people, it's pornography. For some people, it's money. For some people, it's accolades. It's man's approval. For some people, it's, it's uh, you know, winning all the time. There's just, we, we, all have, we all have lures, things that we want, that we think, that we think will make us happy if we get them. Some people, it's materialism. The more things I acquire, the happier I'm going to be. And what's, what's sad is when you get the thing that you think is the lure, there's, sometimes there's a hook in there and there's a barb. And you're like, oh, I hurt. I, I can't get it loose. And so we got to know what triggers us. We got to know what, what we're liking or what we're seeing. See, what tempts me may not be a temptation to you and vice versa. You may say, oh, I'm really tempted by this. And I'm like, yeah, I don't have a problem with that. I'm really tempted to eat liver and onions every day constantly. Really? Because that doesn't bother me. I have no need for that stuff. So we all have different triggers. We all have different temptations. We all have things that we're struggling with. And just because I'm a pastor doesn't mean I don't have lures and bait too. You know, but some people think pastors are perfect people. And you're pretty much right. No, I'm joking. <laughs> we're not. I'm telling you, we have just as many struggles and problems and issues. Listen, this is what I tell our staff. New levels, new devils. New levels, new devils. As the church gets bigger, as things grow, as this happens, there's new devils up there. But you've got to be strong. Your roots have to be deep so you can hold the fruit. If your roots aren't strong, you can't hold the fruit. You're going to break. So find out, <clears throat> search your own soul and find out what tempts you. And then... Here's the thing. Why? Why 
Why does it tempt you? Why do you think masking your trouble with alcohol or drugs is an answer? Why? If you can start to get to the what and the why, you're going to have a much better time avoiding, a much easier time avoiding temptation. Because you'll start to recognize that, wait a minute, this is what this is. And this is what I thought that would do for me. So it's almost like when you're tempted, this is what's cool. It's almost like as you grow in faith and as you grow in the Lord and as you search your soul and you find out what your temptation, what your trigger, what your lure, what your bait is, then it's almost like when you're tempted, you can almost stand aside, almost step aside of yourself, look at the issue from outside and say, I see what's going on here and I also recognize that that doesn't work. Now, that doesn't fix everything because you still have this desire. And so it's God change my desire. God change my heart. That's the key. That's the answer. I'd like you to, to bow your heads. Wait, I want you to see that last slide. Come back. Come back. Can you put it on that last slide? The one before? That, not that one. That one's the one beneath it. It says... This bow head says, God bless you, because that's what I want to do. There it is. Look at it. Look at it. God bless you. Let's bow our heads. You know, that's one of my jobs. One of my jobs as a priest is to bless you. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I bless this church. I bless the people of this church in their struggle and in their fight. God, I pray you toughen each one of them. We want to be fighters. I don't want to lay down. I don't want to run. I don't want to cower. I want to be a fighter. I want to be strong and encouraged. Stay strong. Stay strong. Stand strong. In Jesus' name, be blessed. Amen.